Let's pause in your presence this afternoon to thank you that we can invite the Holy Spirit to be present. And we pray that he'll be here as we study into your word again this afternoon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Th this afternoon, we have got a little bit of detail to go through, but not a lot to cover. Okay? What we're looking at is Revelation chapter 17. And you remember last week, we started on the interpretation of Revelation chapter 17 and we looked at the identity of the woman, the great prostitute, and her name is Babylon the Great and we identified her as that union of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. So this afternoon we're going to continue on Revelation chapter 17 and what I want to cover are the heads and the beast of Revelation chapter 17. Next week, we will look at the horns and the significance of the water upon which the woman sat. And this will involve us in going into Revelation chapter 16 and drawing the <coughs> connections between the two. And we'll see how we go, but after that there might be another one session where we clean up anything that needs to be discussed. Because we're not going through the chapter <coughs> verse by verse and dealing with all the details. I'm trying to give you the big overall picture. Now, this afternoon, what's important is you follow the process. You get the process that we use, particularly with the heads and the horns, you get the process clear, the steps that we have actually, um, that we are actually um, taking. All right, so we'll start now on Revelation chapter 17. And we'll start with verse 6. This is the response of John to the vision that he was shown in verses 2 to 5. Okay? In verse 6 he says, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled greatly. And so here's John's response to what he's seen in those preceding three verses. The word marveled greatly, I marveled greatly, <coughs> in the Greek... It literally reads, <coughs> I wondered with a great wonder. So that's how he expresses it. <coughs> Excuse me. I wondered with a great wonder. Now, the word translated wondered, sometimes it's translated astonished. So he's not only surprised, but he's kind of shocked by what he's seen. He's seen this woman high status because she's dressed in fine linen of scarlet and purple. And the second thing he's noticed about her is that she's absolutely covered from top to bottom with jewels and pearls and gold. And so she's rich. But the third thing he's noticed about her too is that this is the woman who's been responsible for the killing of God's people and their persecution. And so this is what makes him astonished or amazed. And I like this word. This is a net Bible, New English translation, astounded. It's so they're just different words that translate this word here. I wondered with a great wonder. And so he's shocked, surprised at what he's seen. I think both. Yes. Uh, I can't comment on that because we're not given that kind of detail in the, basically, in the description. But to be drunk with it means 
totally absorbed in it. You know, she's got no sense really except this. This is her purpose in living, really. It's to maintain her power. And remember who she is? The dragon working through the first beast and the image to the beast. And so this is, this is who she is. And she's, why is she doing this? Why is she drunk with the blood of the saints? She is, but why is she carrying it out? Why? Why? Yes, we all know this, but it's to maintain her authority and her power and her control. Are we clear on this? This is why she's doing it. Any sign of opposition results in persecution. Any lack of conformity lacks uh, results in persecution. So this is the thing that's driving her. It's the maintenance of her own power and her own authority. But notice in verse 7, we come on to the next verse. We've covered these verses before. But the angel said to me, why are you astounded? Why are you amazed? Why do you marvel? I'm going to tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns that carry her. So the angel steps in now and he's going to explain the meaning of these different symbols. All right. Now, what I want us to notice, and, and for this, I didn't put all of the details on the PowerPoint, but if you look at... Okay, let's just take a few moments and get this sorted so everyone's got notes. Everyone okay? That's yours, and this is yours. It's all right, don't worry about it, we're there. We can sort that out later if we need to. Please, go to verse, uh, go to your notes, your handouts, and we have a quick look at uh, sorry just getting another set of notes here this is t34 a beast this is the lecture notes if you get those notes the ones with a staple at the top and i want to have a look at page one so what we're looking at is the order the <coughs> angel interprets the vision now, this is important because we need to follow the same order if it's going to make sense. If we try and do it any other way, because of the integration of the symbols, it will be difficult to understand. So, I've put a review of the structure of verses 8 down to 18. And you notice verse 8, we've got commentary on the beast and the dwellers of the earth. Yeah. We're clear on this? And then we move on in 17, 9 and 10, he interprets the heads. So what comes first? The heads. Now when he's interpreting, actually interpreting, he deals first with the heads. And then in verse 11, as for the beast that was and is not. And so then he deals with the beast. And then thirdly, in verse 12, he deals with the horns and so it's heads first beast and then it is the horns and so that's the order one two and three so that's the order we are following so today we're looking at the heads and the and the beast and the beast the heads and the beast and next week we'll look at the horns and then there's another commentary in verse 13 and 14 where he comments on the horns and the beast in relationship to the lamb. 
We got that? And then comes interpretation of the waters. And then we get a commentary on the horns and the beast and their relationship to the harlot. So you've got two sides. One of those commentaries dealing with the relationship of the horns and the beast to the lamb. And the other is dealing with the relationship of the horns and the beast to the harlot. And then we come finally into verse 18, which we've looked at already. And we get the interpretation of the woman. We get the woman interpreted. Are we all right on this? Yeah. Folks, we just stressed it because, like I said a few moments ago, if we try and adjust the orders, we get ourselves really confused. And you'll see why as we, as we proceed, basically, as we proceed through. Proceed through. All right, now we're dealing with the seven heads. Chapter 17, verse 9 and 10, he says, This calls for a mind with wisdom. So there's going to be some deep thinking involved here. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings. And so there we have it. Now, if some of you got another translation, you may find there's just a handful which translate this as hills. But the Greek word may mean larger hills, but basically it means mountains. It means mountains. In fact, the few that translate it as hills, because I, I checked this, seven times the word for mountain slash hills occurs in Revelation. It's amazing the number of times words will occur exactly seven times, seven references. And in every single case, apart from this verse, that word is translated mountains. All translations, universally, are translating the word orao, which means mountain. They are translating it as mountains, except in this verse where they put in hills. And I think there's some special pleading here because sometimes we take seven hills literally and we apply it to the city of Rome. And I don't think that they really need to do this because what we're getting here is a double jab at the heads. The seven heads are seven mountains, which are seven kings. Okay. Now, mountains in several places in the Old Testament represent nations. We clear on this? Mm -hmm. And so... When he uses the word seven mountains, they are also seven king, kings or nations. He's just using Old Testament usage. Isaiah 41, 15 and 16. God speaks to his people in Judah and he says, Behold, I will make you a threshing sledge. You know, this was for threshing the wheat. huh? New, sharp and having teeth. And so they would make like a sledge with these sharp teeth on the bottom and they'd run it over the harvested grain and it would chop up the chaff, the stalks to chaff, and it would loosen the grains, you see. And then they would throw the chaff and the wheat up into the air and the wind would blow away the chaff and they left with the wheat. So when he talks about this, Judah is going to become a threshing sledge. Now notice, who are they going to thresh? You shall thresh the mountains and crush them. Yes, we'll see that in a minute. You shall make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them. This is throwing the crushed um, crop up into the air and the wind blowing away the chaff. And the wind will carry them away. See, this is just using the imagery from agriculture. And then it goes and says, and the tempest shall scatter them. And so, who are being scattered? Not literal mountains, but the nations. Judah in the hand of God is going to be like a threshing sledge. And the nations that have been opposing and oppressing God's people are going to be crushed by them and destroyed 
by them. And you shall rejoice in the Lord. Hey, we've got similar kind of imagery in Daniel chapter 2. doesn't mention the sled, but remember that stone? Strikes the image at the feet, it becomes fine dust. And then a mighty wind blows it all away. It's like chaff before the wind. So the same imagery is used there. Um, Jeremiah is really clear. 51, 24 to 25. This is against Babylon and the nations and the inhabitants of Chaldea. I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea before your very eyes for all the evil that they have done in Zion, declares the Lord. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain. Who's the destroying mountain? It's Babylon and the inhabitants of Chaldea, we clear on this? So mountains being used as a symbol for Babylon and the Chaldeans that inhabited it, declares the Lord, which destroys the whole earth. I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags and make you what? Who's going to be made a burnt, mount, burnt mountain? mountain? Babylon. So... Are we clear? That's probably the easiest text basically to use. If you want to remember a text, remember this one. And in Daniel 2, 35, remember this. The iron, clay, bronze, silver, gold all together were broken in pieces, became like chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became what? A great mountain and filled the whole earth and then we find that in verses 44 and 45 that this is being interpreted in the days of those kings that's the iron clay bronze silver gold the god of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed nor shall the kingdom be left to another people it shall break in pieces those kingdoms and bring them to an end and it shall stand forever just as you saw a stone cut from a mountain by no human hand, it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. Great God has made known to the king what will take place after this. So the great mountain is God's kingdom that will replace the kingdoms of the earth. We clear on this? So this is the imagery we have in um, in. Revelation chapter 17. The seven heads are seven mountains. They are also seven, seven kings. Now, we need to identify what kings are being represented by these seven heads. Okay? And so that's our next step. Now, the first point to do this is you've got to recognize the heads in history... Um, the angel places the seven mountains or kings in a time sequence. They're in a time sequence. So they'll become clear. Notice this. 10b. Five of what? Fallen. This is the next verse. The seven heads are seven mountains. They are also seven kings. And then he goes on the next verse and he says, five of whom have fallen... One is, and the other is not yet come. And so he's got the seven heads there, and he says to John, hey, five have fallen, one's existing now, and there's another one that's going to follow. Okay, this is where we're getting into the process that I just want you to understand. And so here it is. King number one, two, three, four, and five. These are the ones... That have fallen. The first five have fallen. So we're getting a sequence here. And then he goes on and he says, number six, one, king six, one is. We okay on this? And then he goes on and he says, king seven, the other is not yet come. And so we've got a, we've got a time sequence. So that's the first thing you need to be able to do if you want to identify them is simply sketch out 
the the, the seven heads. Sorry? No, he's not. Don't jump ahead. Let's just follow the processes and see where we come. Um, okay. Now, folks, this is absolutely crucial because sometimes I see on the internet things like this, this is the last pope. You have you heard this? You know, this is the one of the previous popes was the last pope and this is the sign of the end. And they, so they interpret all of this according to popes. And we get a whole lot of heresies coming up amongst our church members on this business because they don't follow a clear process. And we're just following step by step through. We'll come to the meaning of it. All right, now. Let's have a look. Who is the angel speaking to? When he gives John the sequence, when the angel gives the sequence, who's he speaking to? Yeah, look at this, verse 7. But the angel said to me, why do you, who's the you? John, I will tell you, who is it? John. And so we've got a time sequence here. And the one that is must be the one that was around at John's time. Are we clear on this? Okay. So the angel speaking to John, and this is setting a time frame for us to interpret and understand who these heads represent. Okay. Now, the one that is, because he's speaking to John, is the one that existed at John's time. Are we okay on this? Okay. The five that have fallen are the ones that existed prior to John. Okay? They, they were in existence. They'd fallen by the time John's time come. There were five heads before him. And the other has not yet come. There's another one going to exist after John's time. I mean, this is just simple logic. Now, you're correct in what you said, that the one that is at John's time was pagan Rome. It's the Roman Empire. Because it was the Roman Empire that put John on the island of Patmos. It was the Roman Empire that was basically responsible for the death of Jesus in A.D. 30, 31. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's the right date. Okay, now, the second thing we've got to do, once we've got that sequence laid out, <coughs> five fallen, one is, that's the one at John's time, we've got to recognize the source of the imagery, where this imagery comes from. Now, you've got sheet number 34A. <laughs> 34A, worksheet 34A. If you have a look at worksheet 34A, <coughs> you'll be able to follow it. This is your worksheet, this one, one of these ones. Now, worksheet one, the imagery of a beast with seven heads and ten horns is already familiar to us because where did we see it? We saw it in Revelation. It's in chapter 17, but where else is it in Revelation chapter 17? A revelation. It's in chapter 13. Now have a look at the text. Revelation chapter 13. Verse 1 and 2. I saw a beast rising out of the sea. With what? Seven horns and ten heads. Ten horns. And seven heads. Yeah, sorry. If I... Mixed it up. Seven heads and ten horns. And so this is a previous reference to the beast in Revelation chapter 17. We're clear on this? Now, where does this imagery come from? Look, he tells us in verse 2. The beast I saw was like a 
leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And this is a reference back to Daniel chapter 7. And so the roots of the imagery of the beast with seven heads and ten horns is to be found in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 13. Uh, sorry, Daniel chapter 7. Are we all right on this? So we've gone back now to Daniel chapter 7. And in Daniel 7, you've got the lion, you've got the bear, you've got the leopard. I think you'll find there's a chart in your notes on this. And then there is the fourth beast. The lion has got one head. The lion has got no horns. We're clear on this? Because the beast in Revelation chapter 13, it's a composite beast. It's one beast, but it's got all the parts that come out of the beast in, Revela in Daniel chapter 7. It's like he's taken the four beasts in Daniel chapter 7 and he squeezed them into one. Are we clear on this? Okay, what he's saying is, when you study Daniel chapter 7, stop seeing the beasts as separated powers they're really part of one whole because they're all under the control of a supernatural being who's using them and playing them like puppets and so that's why he's push it, putting them together in Revelation chapter 13 are we clear on this? now if it's a composite beast the total number of heads the lion's got one, the bear's got one, the leopard has four, and the fourth beast has one. We've got seven heads. Lion, no horns, bear, no horns, leopard, no horns, but the fourth beast has got ten. And so that's where the imagery is coming from. It's coming out of Daniel chapter 7. Are we okay on this? All right, now we are ready to start unraveling the meaning of the heads in Revelation chapter, 13, uh, chapter 17. All right. Okay, this is the meaning. The lion represents Babylon. We're clear on this? The bear represents Medo-Persia. Medo the leopard represents Greece. And the fourth beast represents pagan Rome. So folks, you already know that the sixth, we're down back in Revelation chapter 17. The sixth head or the sixth kingdom is pagan Rome. Clear on this? Mm. Which is the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. <coughs> we okay? We've already done this. We're just connecting. The sixth head is the one that is at John's time, which we already identified as pagan Rome. But now we see he's the fourth beast. See pagan Rome? Fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. All right, so all you've got to do now is use Daniel chapter 7. We okay? So what's the third beast of Daniel chapter 7? That must be the fifth head. You okay or not? We're just following Daniel 7. We've plugged it in to Daniel chapter 7 into 
Revelation chapter 17. And the second beast must be the fourth head. And the first beast must represent the, the third head. And so we've got now, we've got two others. We've got the second head and before that we've got the first head. But Daniel starts with Babylon, with the lion, because he's going from the time of Nebuchadnezzar to the end of time. So he starts in his time. That's Daniel. And so the third head is Babylon. We okay? Mm -hmm. You've got the dates roughly there. And the fourth horn is the second beast, which is Medo, Persia. And the third beast is Greece. We all right? Yep. And so we've got those plugged in, but we know after the fourth beast comes the little horn, which represents papal Rome. We okay? And so papal Rome must be the seventh head. There's a little horn of Daniel 7. So we've used Daniel 7 to plug in for the interpretation of those heads. We're on or not? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is simple and logical. If we just follow the processes, if we don't have a process here, we're going to grab all kinds of stuff. We're going to have popes thrown in and we're going to have Roman emperors thrown in and we're going to have all kinds of things thrown in to confuse the picture. So all you've got to do is lay out five fallen. One is and one is yet to come. Yeah? No, the one is is the one at John's time, which was pagan Rome, which is the fourth beast of Daniel 7. And then just go back through Daniel 7. Then you can identify the three preceding ones. These ones. Now, these are persecuting powers. We clear on this? The powers that have controlled and persecuted God's people down through the ages. Before Babylon came the kingdom of Assyria. Assyria. You've got diagrams in your notes. The kingdom of Assyria must be the second. And prior to this slavery in Egypt, and that must be the first. And so we've identified the seven heads of the beast in Revelation chapter 17, just by lining it up with Daniel chapter 7 and with Old Testament history. So what we're getting here is we're getting a, a timeline. A timeline of the times of trouble down through the ages that have involved God's people. Are we all right on this? Yeah, look, to me, this is the way I'm seeing this. To me, it's Papal Rome from 538 to 1798. That's now we're getting right into Revelation chapter 12, chapter 13 with the first period of persecution. Remember the woman in the wilderness? Mm -hmm. Yeah? The first beast making war on her for 42 months, receiving a deadly wound. Mm -hmm. That's how I see this. Mm -hmm. We okay, huh? Yep. It, it's, it's, it's not complicated <coughs> if we just 
follow a, a, a clear... It's a natural flow. It's a natural flow. It's just simply recognizing the roots of the imagery <laughs> come out of Daniel chapter 7. So we go back to Daniel chapter 7. It's history. And look at it. Yeah, exactly. It's For us, it is history because we're standing at the end and we're looking back through the whole lot, aren't we? So the five that have fallen were Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. The one that is, is pagan Rome that was around at John's time. And the one that is yet to come is the little horn, papal Rome. Now, if we're clear on this, all we've got to do now is look at the meaning of the, um, the beast. Now here, be careful because we want to jump and we want to just pull things out of context, but we're just going to follow the logic of Revelation chapter 17. Now, all right. Yeah, here I've done it on this diagram. You've got this in your notes. I'm pretty sure you've got this in your notes. Fourth beast plugs in here, pagan Rome, and then we have the leopard preceded by the bear, preceded by the lion, and the leopard is Greece, the bear is Medo-Persia, and the lion is Babylon. And following, before Babylon, we had Assyria, and that was preceded by Egypt. And so there we've got the first five kings these are the ones that have fallen okay and then we move in the other direction and we see that after the fourth beast came the little horn this is all daniel 7 this is all daniel 7 comes a little horn and the little horn must be the one that existed after um, king 7 after john's time papal rome this is the one Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians, the Antichrist, who will come. All right, now the beast. This is quite simple. Um, I'm just outlining the seventh. Sorry, this should be verse 11. As for the beast that was and is not, he is what? He's an eighth. But he goes on and says... He belongs to the seven. So the sequence of heads doesn't finish here with the little horn because he's adding, he's saying, there's another one yet to follow him. And that's the beast in Revelation chapter 17 and it should be verse 11 and it will go into destruction. All right. Okay, now, the little horn is the sea beast of Revelation chapter 13. We're clear on this? Because we've already covered it, we proved it. Chapter 13, the little horn is the first beast, the beast out of the sea. If you can't remember, go back to your notes where we looked at the identity of the um, first beast in Revelation chapter 13. And so now we're plugging in to Revelation chapter 13. We all right? And the sea beast is followed by? He's followed by the land beast, Revelation 13, 11 to 17. And so to me, the eighth, the beast, the eighth king in the series is the land beast of Revelation chapter 13. Are we all right on this or not? So what we've done is, let me just do a quick sketch, because folks, it's only the process you've got to be clear on. You don't have to memorize this. You've just got to be able to work it out. Okay. So we come to Revelation chapter 17, yeah? And we've got the heads. We've got the first, 
the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth head fallen. We've got the sixth head is yeah, and then we've got one yet to come and that is the seventh head. Now as you said, the one that is, the one at John's time, yeah? And so now we plug in to pagan Rome. We okay? So we've got one identified. But then we said, hey, all this imagery of seven heads and ten horns is coming out of Daniel chapter 7. It's coming out of Daniel chapter 7. Okay. And so then we move on to Daniel chapter 7 and we say pagan Rome is the fourth beast. Clear? And then we just work back. Third, second, first. So the third one is the lion, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and this is pagan Rome. And then we go to history and we find before this we've got Assyria and we have got Egypt and coming after the fourth beast we've got the little horn as the seventh so that's all Daniel chapter 7 okay all right now what we're doing is we're going to the beast. And what does it say about the beast? He's an eighth. But he's in that sequence of seven. We okay on this? And so the beast now is number eight. That's the beast. We all right? He's number eight. And so how are we going to identify him? It's quite easy because now we go to the little horn here and we know... The little horn is the first beast of Revelation chapter 13. We all right on this? Mm -hmm. And he's going to be followed by the second beast, the land beast of Revelation chapter 13. And this takes us right up to the end of time, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And so the second beast of Revelation chapter 13 must be equivalent to the beast that the woman's sitting on in Revelation chapter 17. And we've already identified him as the United States, USA. And so we've got now, we've identified. This is giving us a timeline. Right, almost from the beginning, the patriarchal period, right through the history of Israel into the church period and it's telling us that during this time because the dragons behind all of this business there's going to be eight great persecuting powers that God's people suffer under and when we come right up to here to the beast we're dealing with right at the end time we clear on this because mm -hmm. he's the last He's the last. And what we keep in mind is this, that the woman, where's she seated? She's seated on the beast. She's seated on this one. And so we could put, if we wanted to, we could put the threefold union here. And she's sitting on him. She's riding him. He's under her control. Yeah? And she's going to be pulling the reins and directing and guiding whatever direction it wants. And so this is taking us right into the final conflict. The final stage of the great controversy. 
where the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war on the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And so this is bringing us right up to that time of the war on the remnant. But chapter 17 is going to go beyond this and say God is going to deal with the situation. And that's what we'll start to see next week. When we look at the horns, because now we're set, we're ready to look at the horns and identify um, the horns. And that will complete this picture here of the final conflict. Um, wait till next week. We, we <laughs> we, we, yeah. But we're clear up to this point, aren't we? What we'll see next week with the horns, we'll follow it through carefully. We'll see that the horns represent political powers of the earth that join the beast. And so what has started in Revelation 13 with the United States suddenly becomes in chapter 16, remember it becomes something that involves the kings of the whole world. And that's what we'll see. But that's not where the chapter will end because the chapter will then go into the details and say, this is how God's going to deal with it. Come, I will show you the judgment, the bold plague on the great harlot. And so we'll see next week what God actually does to unravel this whole coalition of religious and political powers of the earth which are being directed against God's people and God's church. Right at the end. So that's our work for next week. But we're all right on this. It's, it's not difficult. If, if you, if you want to do some practice, then all you need to do is just open Revelation chapter 17, read those verses, and just draw a sketch. Don't copy a diagram from mine, but just draw your own. Just start constructing your own. Say, right, this is it, the one that is. Find the verse. That's John's being spoken to, so it's John's time. And then this is all coming out. Imagery is coming out of Daniel 7. And so just lay out Daniel 7 and then look at the beast, which is the eighth in the sequence. He's the final end time persecuting power. And that will take you into Revelation chapter 13 and you just tie the two together and you got it. See, no popes, no popes in this. <laughs> Clear as mud. <laughs> yeah. Basically, you're saying that uh, Satan is actually ruling God's church inside most of his church is taken up by the beast power. Ah. Yeah, it's that's that's a good that's a good comment and this that's an issue that's causing a lot of confusion in PG. You see, the woman the woman in the wilderness persecution stops. You get that massive outburst, particularly in America it started, but you get that massive outburst of Protestant denominations. These are the seed of the woman. And it's the seed of the woman that become the target of the dragon. And the dragon draws a lot of them away through deception, through those great signs, that counterfeit revival. He draws them away into his camp. And then you're left with a group that's called the rest of her offspring, the ones who weren't caught up in this deceptive working of Satan. And those are the ones there now, the deceived seed of the woman become the key operators in persecuting the seed of the woman who remained faithful to God, you see. Are we clear on this? So that's, that's basically what you're saying, but that's the dynamics that will be involved at the end of time. Because that's always been the way, isn't it? Yeah. It's always been the church, but the church has basically been run by Satan. It's just that a small number of people who have been faithful to God. Yeah, I, I just think we need to be a bit careful with language. Because um, when you say the church run by Satan, it could be picked up by others and it could have connotations that we don't really want it. So I'll just look at history once again. Right back to the Garden of Eden with uh, Cain and Abel. Yeah. You find this large number. Instead of saying 
that Satan um, is controlling the church, which is too broad, I would just say, that many Christians fall under the delusions of Satan. Um, but you're right. And do you know what's going to make that difference between the offspring who are deceived, that's the offspring deceived, and the rest who are not deceived? Because there's one thing that's going to make the big difference between them. And to be honest, it's the book of Revelation. It's understanding the prophecies of chapter 12, 13, 14, the material we're dealing with at the moment. This is, this is the critical key material that will enable us to see that what's happening around us is not of God, but it's of Satan. You're following? It's just having that simple basic outline and knowing when counterfeit revival starts and great miracles are being performed around us, be careful because Satan is going to get in first with a counterfeit revival pretending to be the Holy Spirit in order to capture people and draw them together on the basis of this religious experience in the spirit and he'll draw them together and you'll get this union of churches, a me mega church coming out of the denominationalism and it'll be a church that claims to have the power and the working of the Holy Spirit through it and they'll offer you evidences. But we know from Revelation that we are to expect this. And one of the testing grounds will be, one, the teachings of Revelation which put the focus on that group that keep the what? They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony and the faith of Jesus and so that's going to make that's going to make the difference and folks I don't know if you've been following Trump in America and the QAnon um, QAnon conspiracy business that's going on there um, people are just being swept into delusions in mass in America over 70 million people in America in some way one way or another are Trump supporters and are following this, 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 this heresy and it, I just think of this in the light of I'm not saying this is the great deception but just to see how vulnerable people are to being deceived and if you've got no grounding in the word how are you going to be able to judge the spiritual forces behind movements you're not going to be able to do it at all and the dragon since the 1970s has had an all-out attack on scripture and confidence in the word amongst Christians. And we are in a, a very, very small minority at the moment. There are even people today, I remember watching, I think it was on YouTube, this couple of parents, these parents taking their small boys, probably about six or seven, into a church and he was making a bit of noise and they said, shh, this is God's house. And the kid turned around and said, and who's God? Who's God? And that's the world we're living in today. He's trying to remove Christianity, well, exactly. Satan's trying to remove it. Every single program you watch, every single program that comes on, which is a documentary on Christianity, and it is designed to undermine faith in Scripture. Undermine faith in Scripture. I watched one on Herod the Great, which dealt historically with Herod and the way he killed his sons and his own wife. And then it came up to the slaughter of the children in Bethlehem. And it says, yeah, but you can't really believe that because it's only found in Matthew's gospel and who can trust the gospels, see? So that's, that's the way it goes and plants that seed. Oh, yeah, okay. He was like this, but we don't think he did that. This is just something that the Christians made up and it's there in scripture yeah very sad anyway folks thank you let's have prayer just to close father again this afternoon we just want to thank you for the opportunity we've had again to study your word we pray lord you continue to bless us as we do so both here as a community together on a sabbath afternoon but not only here lord but also in our own homes as we work 
through revelation and we contemplate it we pray that you'll be with us that you'll reinforce the lesson so that when the time is appropriate the time comes when this is really relevant to our lives and experience you'll bring these things back to our mind we pray in jesus name amen